Hi, and welcome to a lecture on ground planes. Ground planes are planar surfaces that are electrically conducting and play a role in many types of arrays. Let's begin with patch arrays. An array of patch antennas is attractive as an array design for two reasons. One is because patch elements have high directivity. That's an intrinsic feature of the patch element. So if you want an array having high directivity, then it's attractive to use the patch as an element of the array. The other attractive feature of a patch antenna is that it's half space limited. And by that I mean the electronics can easily be located out of the way, in particular, below the ground plane. And the reason that works is because the electric field is small, in fact, zero for an infinite ground plane, beneath the ground plane. So the idea of the patch array is that each element has a pattern which, simplified, looks like these circles. No field below the ground plane. So if you put electronics down there, they're not going to interfere with the behavior of the array. Now the disadvantage of patches as elements is primarily bandwidth. And that's because the impedance match efficiency is limited to a small fractional bandwidth. That fractional bandwidth is typically on the order of a few percent. So for example, if you have an array which is intended to operate at a center frequency of 10 gigahertz, it would not be unusual to have a patch array that exhibited reasonable impedance match efficiency only over 100 megahertz or so. And that's not enough for many modern applications. There certainly are applications where this is sufficient, but in many modern applications, you might want many times this kind of bandwidth, which means you either have to do something complicated with the patch, or you have to look for another element. Things that significantly improve the performance of patch arrays in terms of bandwidth usually require additional loss. In fact, loss is the primary way to improve the impedance match efficiency of any element. So this obviously is detrimental in the sense that radiation efficiency goes down, so the sensitivity is degraded, and also, because you have loss, you have heat dissipated by that loss, so you have increased heat. Those are the pros and cons of a patch array. A common alternative is a dipole array. A dipole, as an element, has a much better impedance match efficiency in terms of its fractional bandwidth. Typically, instead of just a few percent, it's typically tens of percent. So it would not be unusual for a dipole array to start off with an impedance match efficiency, which is already on the order of 10 times greater than that of a patch array in very round numbers. Also, dipoles have intrinsically higher radiation efficiency to start. That should be higher, of course, not lower. The downside of a dipole array, of course, is if you just have dipoles, they're omnidirectional with respect to the axis of the dipole. So you get a lobe up here, and you get a lobe down here. In fact, you get this donut-shaped pattern. There's no obvious way to get the electronics completely out of the way. The other issue is that dipoles have relatively low directivity. So a typical dipole, a half-wave dipole, will have directivity of about 2 dBi, and that's in contrast to somewhere between 5 and 8 dBi for a patch. So you're starting off with a lower directivity, so you need more elements to get the same array directivity. However, these issues can be ameliorated using a ground plane. So the idea is you take that same array of dipoles and you put it some distance above a ground plane. That distance we're calling H. Now you can see right away that this is going to help for two reasons. One is it gives you now a place to put the electronics. The electronics can go down here and not interfere with the array, just as they do in the patch array. Furthermore, the fields have to be completely above the ground plane, so the directivity of this arrangement must go up. How much it goes up is a question that we'll have to answer, but it's clear that the directivity is going to be improved by doing this, if for no other reason that the fields are contained to the upper half space, to half the available sphere. So, what is an appropriate choice for this spacing between the dipoles and the ground plane? Let's answer that question. It's actually not hard to answer. Let's think of this in the transmit case. 
In the transmit case, we have this dipole, distance h above the ground plane. So radiation from the dipole experiences a phase shift, and that phase shift is equal to e to the minus j beta h, where beta is the phase propagation constant. All right? So the phase shift will be uh, minus beta h to get to the ground plane. At the ground plane, the radiation experiences a reflection. And reflection from a ground plane introduces a phase shift of 180 degrees or minus 1. That's e to the plus j pi. And then, of course, since it's reflected, it will travel back to the dipole. And so we'll see another phase contribution of e to the minus j beta h once again. So the total phase shift starting at the dipole, traveling to the ground plane, and returning to the dipole will be e to the minus j beta h times e to the plus j pi times e to the minus j beta h again, or e to the minus j 2 beta h minus pi. Now what we want for maximum directivity would be to make this quantity 2 beta h minus pi equal to zero because then the reflected wave would be in phase with the wave that's traveling away from the ground plane. So in other words, this wave that's coming back from the ground plane would be in phase with the radiation directly from the dipole and outward. So we want 2 beta h minus pi to be equal to some multiple of 2 pi, where that multiple might be 0, might be 1, and so on. All those values of n would result in this relationship giving us the desired in-phase contribution. So if we solve for beta h, we find that beta h should be n plus 1 half times pi. And since beta is the phase propagation constant, it's equal to 2 pi over lambda. So we find that h over lambda is n over 2 plus 1 quarter. Now the smallest value of n is 0, so the smallest value of h over lambda is 1 quarter, or we could say that differently, h should be lambda divided by 4 for the smallest distance. Of course, we could also go 3 lambda by 4, 5 lambda by 4, and so on. Those would also result in an in-phase contribution, but the smallest such separation is a quarter wavelength, h equals lambda by 4. For this reason, it's common to see dipoles a quarter wavelength above a ground plane, and even more common to see design processes in which the designer will start with the dipoles being a quarter wavelength above the ground plane and then adjusting from that height. Now, you might ask the question, how do I analyze arrays of elements over a ground plane? And this turns out to be very easy. And the key is to use image theory. Image theory is a general concept in electromagnetics, but the part of image theory that we need here is very, very simple. And in fact, we can interpret it graphically. The idea is to start off with this picture on the left, where we have a dipole, and it's radiating. And so we get a direct contribution from the dipole, and we get a reflected contribution due to reflection from the ground plane. Image theory in this case tells us that we can replace this picture with a picture, which is equivalent in a sense I'll reveal in a moment, where we remove the ground plane. So there's no ground plane. There is the original dipole in the original place and the original orientation. There is the original direct contribution. But in lieu of the reflected contribution, what we have instead is a second dipole, which is the same distance below the omitted ground plane, then the original dipole is above the omitted ground plane. And we have a sign change. So the contribution from this dipole goes like this. And if we have the exact same dipole, except with a sign change in the excitation, then this contribution will look exactly like this contribution on the left in the upper half space. So if we construct a new problem consisting of these two dipoles in free space, where the lower dipole has this sign change, then what we will find is that the fields above the ground plane are the same in both cases, but the fields below the ground plane are different, obviously, because in the first original problem, the fields below the ground plane are zero, but in the new problem, the fields below the ground plane are not zero. So if we keep that limitation in mind, 
that the fields below the ground plane will be different, image theory works great for figuring out what the field should be above the ground plane. And what we've done then is remove the ground plane and replaced it with another dipole, and that makes the problem a lot easier to do. Now, before proceeding, I should make one other comment here, and, and this is important. The discussion above assumes that the ground plane is infinite in extent. In other words, it has no edges. But in fact, any practical ground plane will have edges. Here's a square ground plane, for example, and the array might go within some fraction of that ground plane. So you could fairly ask, what is the effect of going from an infinite ground plane to a finite ground plane? And the principal difference will be the presence of edge diffraction. And what edge diffraction is, is energy that radiates from the edges of the ground plane because the elements excite those edges. So from each edge, we would expect to see a new contribution. Now, if the ray is electrically large, we would expect this to be not a big contribution. Nevertheless, because there is edge diffraction, you will see two things happen. One is that you will see pattern ripple everywhere. The ripple has to do with these edge diffracted fields interacting with the element fields. But since the diffraction tends to be relatively small, the pattern ripple can be pretty small. So instead of seeing a pattern which is smooth, you might see a pattern which has a little bit of ripple on it like that. And the magnitude and spacing of the ripple will have to do with how big the ground plane is. Of course, if the ground plane edges recede to infinity, then that ripple will become vanishingly small and the ripple spacing will become very large. The other consequence of edge diffraction is significant error near end fire. See, what happens is these elements are directive primarily near broadside. So as you get close to end fire, to the plane of the ground plane, diffraction will become the dominant contribution. So what you will see when you have a finite ground plane is that you can have fields below the ground plane. They can get there by diffracting around the edge. So you will see that the pattern is relatively accurate near broadside where the element pattern dominates, but the prediction will be relatively poor in the plane of the array and below the array because diffraction will become dominant in those regions. To summarize, two main points. Arrays of dipoles about one quarter wavelength above a ground plane are popular. They're popular for three reasons. One is they have pretty good directivity. Another one is that the ground plane gives a logical place for the electronics to go, namely below the ground plane, where they will not electromagnetically interact with the elements. And they have reasonable IME bandwidth, typically much better than patch elements and arrays comprised of patches. The second main point is that elements over a ground plane with any spacing are easy to analyze using image theory, as long as you keep in mind this limitation about edge effects, which tend to be more important in the plane of the array and below the array, where diffraction becomes the dominant contribution and the edge elements are relatively less important. That concludes this lecture on ground planes.